All right, so we are in the fifth week in our series called Opportunities and Threats. And this series is coming from the present context of our world, of our country, in which there is certainly a cultural earthquake that's going on, and we can all feel it. The ground is shaking beneath us. It's not settled and it's not stopping. And so as we have journeyed for five weeks, you, you know the, the basic message by now, which is this is not the time to duck and cover. This is not the time to follow the normal human instinct and shrink back, but rather, according to 1039 of Hebrews, we want to take the posture where they say, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. And that shrink back is a, is a sailing reference to when the sailors would lower the sails. It's this picture of kind of giving in for the day, or in this context, it would be giving up. It would be kind of giving in to defeat. You gotta lower the sails. And the writer here says, hey, even though the time's hard, it's not the time to lower the sails and be destroyed. So there is a reality that sometimes that, that gut level reaction of shrinking back or taking cover, or lowering the sails is actually could be to our own destruction there's a time to dig in and now is such a time and so right now we are looking at different ways in which there are threats that are coming our way but those threats also bring opportunities and so in the first week we just looked at that that challenging reality of God's word of any time we Things are tough, but we're looking at continuing to desire to see the kingdom of God advance. The Bible almost always starts by saying, take personal responsibility. That was week one. Don't look outward and blame others for all the problems. First, you take personal responsibility. We look in the mirror and we say, God, show me and grow me. How can I learn? How can I grow? How can I be transformed to be more like Jesus in my responses to tough times? And we too, we said... Care for those who are in your immediate sphere of influence, your family, close friends, that biblical picture of oikos or extended spiritual family that God's given you influence with to encourage one another, to build one another up, absolutely vital in times of crisis. The last two weeks we've been looking at local mission, looking out into our city, looking for those divine appointments God has given us, looking for those, uh, those people of peace where God has given us favor, those very positive relationships where God's given you influence and the importance, such extreme importance right now in continuing to look, turn that radar on, look for those opportunities, look for those divine appointments, keep those relationships strong, keep those connections strong. Because even though times are tough and things are shut down, God has certainly not forgotten about his mission. His agenda remains the same. The harvest is plentiful. So our job is to remain willing, available, adaptable, and willing to sacrificially serve those around us. And so there's kind of these concentric circles in this series on purpose because Jesus spoke of mission and he spoke of it in a way where there's kind of some concentric circles where you start with yourself, those closest to you, and then you go outward. Jesus said it like this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's like your hometown, your backyard, starting with your family, and then in Judea, Sumeria, to the ends of the earth. So we're moving outward. And today we kind of want to move beyond our own city and look to our state, look to other states. And we look and we ask the question, are there threats coming our way? And in the midst of this cultural earthquake, yes, a very clear message is coming our way on the state level, in many states. The message from state authorities to churches right now in a variety of different ways 
is it you don't matter much. You are certainly not essential to our society. So shut down and stay shut. So let's back up a little bit. In March, early-ish March, when the COVID lockdown began and hit, our church and most others that I know of complied with that order to shut down the in-person activities of the church because, yeah, we're like, hey, that, we want to do our part in protecting the vulnerable, slowing the spread of the disease so that the healthcare system is not overwhelmed and people can be cared for, the sick can be taken care of. That's good. We agree. We want to protect the vulnerable, care for the sick. But as things eased up in May, we noticed that churches, quite simply, weren't part of the plan. In California, at least. Churches being able to reopen for any type of in-person activities were way at the back end of like stage, I don't know, 27, <laughs> wherever, wherever the back end is. There's a lot of them. But there was this indefinite point in the future. I mean, churches, honestly, were not even spoken of in the, in the public addresses. Church was never even mentioned at that point that, hey, we're thinking about you. We know it's important for you to reopen, so here's the plan. And back in the fine print, along other outdoor entertainment, with no regard for the size of the church. So whether you had a thousand people or a church of 25, even with the desire to strictly adhere to social distancing precautions, churches were told to stay closed, period, doesn't matter. A thousand or 25. No nuance in that at all. So I think that kind of woke the church up a bit with a message from the state authorities that, hey, church, we're, you're not really even on our minds. You don't really matter that much. You're, you're, you're in the fine print somewhere. You're not really essential. We're not even really trying to find a way to help you get back open. And that message has become even more clear in the ensuing months. So right now in Riverside County, as of the beginning of this week, in a county of over two and a half million people, which doing research I found out, that's actually more populous than 15 states and Washington, D.C. So Riverside County has a greater population than 15, if I did my math right, you can check it out, of the states in our United States of America. So in, in the county of over two and a half million people, there are 82 ICU beds in COVID use and 492 available. And 200, 223 total hospital beds in COVID use out of a total of 3,476 beds. My point in saying this is the hospital system is not overwhelmed. There are a lot of beds available. And yet, churches are told, stay closed indefinitely, be shut down. Even though the healthcare system is not overwhelmed, you must be closed. And even worse now, there are a number of churches in, the, in California who have been threatened with criminal activity for just showing up to church. Pastor Cheon in Pasadena We've been to that church a number of times for conferences. We've took, taken our leaders there. Great church. A lot of good things going on there. They received a letter on August 13th from the city prosecutor, criminal division. I have the letter if you want it. That, that said, holding churches are in violation of the governor's order and, quote, criminal in nature. Criminal. That's a quote. Each day in violation is a separate violation, carries with it a potential punishment of up, up to one year in, in jail. <laughs> one year in jail and a fine for each violation, including parishioners who attend the service. That's a threat. Literally. You can go to jail for a year for attending church right now. In Ventura County, on Tuesday of a few weeks back, the attorney for the, uh, for the county demanded that Pastor Rob McCoy be put in jail for opening his church and also requested that not code enforcement, but armed officers would block the entry to the church so that no worshipers could enter. Thankfully, 
The judge overseeing uh, the case denied the city or the county attorney's, Ventura County's attorney's request for that time being instead gave a, a, a stalled and now Pastor McCoy's wrapped up in a whole contempt of court issue, etc. But we've come a long way since mid-March, five and a half, six months. We're now going to church in California as potentially a punishable crime. That is but two of, of many examples that, that demonstrate the message that our authorities are, are sending our way, that church is not essential. We're not interested in working with you to try to nuance it, to try to, you know, recognize that there's a lot of different flavors and styles of churches. 25 people is a lot different than 1,000 people and social distancing and all that stuff. No, just stay closed. So as a message there, it's just essentially the authorities saying church doesn't matter that much. We'll be fine if, if you just went away. So when the church is faced with a message from the governing authorities that it essentially doesn't matter, certainly not essential, the question for us is, is that time, is that the time to lower our sails, if you will, in compliance with the governing authorities, or is it a time to push back? Dr. Martin Luther King had a quote that is very applicable for this type of situation, I believe regards to the relationship between church and state. He said this. I think we can get it up there. There it is. The church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and critic of the state and never its tool. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. So there's a number of different ways to apply this quote, but the, the prophetic zeal caught my attention. The prophetic nature of the church is to be able to see certain circumstances in the society, to see a context, to see actions and activities, and see the direction that that's trending. Where is that taking society? In other words, you look at current circumstances and you say, if we, say, if we continue down this same road, where are we going to end up as a society? So I believe now is, is such a time, as Dr. King is saying in that setting, to put on that kind of prophetic lens as a church and say, if we don't push back against the church isn't really necessary message, where are we going to end up as a society? Where are we going to end up when, when things get really, really tough? I mean, we, look, we looked at a context of, of a plague in the second and third centuries. The, the plague in the second century wiped out one-third of the population of Rome. One-third! That's, translate that today. If such a thing were to take place, that's like 120 million people. Can you imagine the absolute, utter chaos that our world would be in if 120 million people in the U.S. died of a plague? I mean, we're talking about an utter fraction of that, where it's, you know, population, I don't know the number, but it's like 0.003% or something. Not one-third, like 150,000 people. And every loss of life is tragic. I'm not trying to minimize that. I am saying... Wow, <laughs> if, if we are going down this road as a society right now, where church can be so easily just dismissed as a not essential part, just shut down, we don't really need you, where are we going? Now is such a time, I believe, to push back. So before we get into more specifics about some of the threats and why it's, I believe, an important time as a church in general, not our church, but the church, to push back, there's a familiar passage of Scripture that's brought up often that honestly causes a problem. <laughs> Romans 13. It usually puts an end to these conversations quickly. So let's read it and let's encounter our problem and then let's do what we should often do, which is just interpret it well and read more of God's word. <laughs> Romans 13 says this, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, 
For where there is no, excuse me, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So those first couple verses especially seem to just silence this conversation. There is no authority except from God. Those who exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists, the authorities resist what God has appointed. Every person be subject to the governing authorities. There's more to it. Rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. For he is God's servant for your good. If you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. So that's God's design. Yes, God designed human authority. God designed order in society. God designed structure and government. But the question happens of, so what happens when God's design is, God's design is not followed by those in authority? What happens when rulers become a terror to good conduct what if the sword is brought down upon those who are following God because there are some assumptions in this passage rulers are it says verse 3 rulers are not a terror to good conduct except for the thousand historical examples that we could look to when they are so that would change things. Do what is good, and you will receive his approval. Except for the thousand historical examples, when you can do what is good and receive the wrath of the sword. Context is key in all biblical interpretation. These very circumstances about that I'm talking about, about rulers gone awry, actually happen. In Revelation 13 and 14, the very opposite of the kind of ruler and governing authority that Paul speaks of in Rome or to the Roman church, the very opposite is happening in Revelation 13 and 14. So let's check it out. In verse 13, or chapter 13, verse 16 to 18. The writer, John, is talking about the beast. Let's pick it up in verse 16. The beast causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That's saying this is a human authority. This is not some fantastic, just demonic figure. This is a human authority figure. One of those that Paul talks about in Romans. One of those governing authorities. This is a man. This is a person. The number of the beast, for it is a man. His number is 666. So, should we submit to this governing authority? If this is our context. Should we resist? Because verse 2 of Romans 13 says, if you resist or if you submit, you will incur judgment. Let's move on and read chapter 14. Let's jump right to 9 and 10 for time's sake. So another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, 
poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And in the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, whoever receives the mark in its name. Wow! That's a terrifying passage. In this case, in, Re in Revelation, if you submit to and don't resist that human authority, you will incur God's judgment upon you. So should we sit, submit to this governing authority? Paul says yes, John says no. No. In this case, clearly submission to this governing authority is to your own destruction. Now, what makes this passage even... Actually, hold on. I'm going to pause. We'll get there in a second. But make no mistake, this beast here, this is a human governing authority. And it's a governing authority that almost all good New Testament scholars recognize that 666 is an alphanumeric code that refers to the first century Roman Emperor Nero. who is the Roman Empire or the Roman Emperor at the time that the book of Revelation was written by John. His name, if you convert it in that time using the Greek, etc., alphanumerically, his name goes 666. And you hear John say, hey, hint, hint, <laughs> this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, the, the ruler, it's going to come and do awful things that are against God. It's the number of a man is number 666. Parentheses for a moment. For all you end times buffs out there that get really concerned if, oh no, wait, the beast has already come and gone? I'm looking forward to the beast. Just so you know, prophetic apocalyptic writings that is the genre of Revelation. They are very often cyclical, repetitive. So don't worry. Another beast is coming. End of parentheses. We can talk about that later if you want to. But furthermore, and ironically, the governing authority, a.k.a. the emperor, when Paul is writing his letter to Rome, let me say that a little more clear. When Paul's writing his letter to Rome, Rome, guess who the emperor is? Nero. However, Nero had just begun his emperorship, and he was treating Christians favor favorably at the time. He looked like he had a good and decent posture towards Christians. He, he kind of fulfilled the description of Romans 13 and what a good emperor should do. So it makes sense for Paul to say, hey, Christian, if you do good, don't be afraid. As long as you do good, the emperor is there to make sure good is rewarded. And he holds the sword for those who do evil, do wrong. But it's also well known historically, and lots of New Testament scholars are on this page, that shortly into Nero's reign, he quite possibly literally loses his mind. He goes crazy. And in particular, he goes crazy against Christians. And he unleashes some reign of terror, multiple waves of persecution, to the point that he had many rounds of, of violent persecution on purpose by the state authorities, where they, historical documents show that, and this is outside of the Bible, show that Nero, even at times, arrested Christians, dipped them in tar alive, and had them used as torches to light the path up to his palace. That's when John writes Revelation. So ironically, Nero is probably the governing authority that both writers have in mind. John and Paul. But very different contexts going on. One says be subject to the authorities. The other says if you subject yourself to the authority, it defies God's commands and is to your own doom. To sum up, 
What we see together from these passages is when a governing authority violates the law of God, who should a Christian obey? God, of course. So when Paul says, let every Christian be subject to the governing authorities, you see the rest of that context and he describes what a, a leader is supposed to do. You can see there, there's, there's a, a conditional clause. There's an if clause. If they are making righteous laws that are in alignment with God. And Revelation makes that more clear. And then we're going to get even more clear based on more in the New Testament. But this really shouldn't be too hard for Christians to imagine or believe a historical example that makes this come on like, uh, of course, there is an appropriate time to resist the government. I mean, you only have to go as far, and there are many other examples, but when Hitler started his demonic ploy of the ex extermination of, of Jews and handicapped and gypsies and many other groups, I mean, let's say you decide to, to hide your neighbor, to protect their life, to protect the image of God that they carry, the precious value that God has put on every human life and the Gestapo knocks at your door and they say, are you hiding anyone here? Submit to the authorities. I mean, we, we, we look to heroes. We call them heroes appropriately for those who resisted the authorities. They did not submit to that type of governing leadership. They followed the higher law of God. They recognize there's a time to push back. And obviously, we are, we are not in any way in that type of situation in our country. But a historical example of there is a time to push back, to follow God's laws. Peter and Paul, excuse me, Peter and John show us this in the book of Acts. They are arrested for preaching the gospel. They're beaten, they're brought before the governing authorities, and they are commanded to never preach the name of Jesus again. And what do they do? They quite simply say in that moment, Acts 5.29, we must obey God rather than man. The biblical precedent is that if or when the earthly authorities violate the heavenly authorities... We follow God. The Apostle Paul lived this out for his entire ministry career. The same guy who wrote Romans 13 and said, Submit to authorities and don't resist, spent the vast majority of his three decades of ministry living as a fugitive on the run from governing authorities. If you read the book of Acts, you see Paul. Similarly to Peter and John, defy the direct orders of the governing authorities over and over, which puts his life on the line and creates some very interesting, dramatic episodes of escape. One time he's fleeing in the night in a ship, the other, another time he's being lowered by a basket outside the city walls. Another time he has an angelic visitation in the middle of prison that shakes the foundations and opens it up, showing God's approval and support and provision to Paul in the midst of his defiance of earthly authorities who were in defiance of God's authority. All of that to say, there is a clear biblical precedent that there is a time to push back and resist the governing authorities. And in fact, you could make a clear and compelling case that some of our country's best qualities emerged from a daring little church that chose to defy the King of England and seek opportunity to freely worship God without persecution. In 1620, about 50 brave pilgrims from one church, I mean, 50, 50 people from one church got aboard the Mayflower in defiance of and to flee the persecution from the governing authorities of England. 
That left such an enduring legacy of faith that almost 150 years later, as you could read, feel it all through the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the We the People declarations, in that First Amendment, famously it says, so Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The free exercise thereof. Great phrase. But what is often misquoted is this shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. That's often quoted from people or by people to create this wall of separation between religion and the state, right? However, the clear intention of the writers is their context. You got, we got to always remember context. That was written to protect religion from the state. We have to remember from whence they came. The king of England had made himself both the head of state as emperor, monarch, head of state, and the head of the church. That's a bad combo. So supposedly everything he said as he decreed laws, they were both they had legal authority and they had spiritual authority as the head of the church. They were supposedly of God. So the founders had the wisdom based on their horrible experience with deadly persecution, among other things, that this doesn't work. I don't think this governing authority is of God. I don't think killing Christians in the name of God is of God. So they had the wisdom to know that those things are a bad combo. So this amendment was put in to protect them, to have God, to protect us, to protect all of posterity in the United States, to have God as their highest authority to whom they would submit when the authority of man was failing. Much more to be said on that in a later time. But to sum up, so far we have seen there is excellent biblical precedent and inspiring historical precedent which says there is a time, there is an appropriate time to resist the governing authorities. And I believe now is such a time. Now, we're not saying this, we're not trying to say this with a, a flippant or a contrarian attitude or spirit, but hopefully with one that's more along the lines of the prophetic nature of the church. Like Dr. King was referencing that the church is not the master of the state nor the servants, but, but the conscience. And there has to be a time to capture that, that prophetic nature where, say, where we can say, hey, we see where things are going. And if this trend continues, it's going to take us down a road we don't want to be. So there is that time to stand up in our own way as church to say, if we continue down that road, we've lost our way. I believe now is such a time. When we hear the message that church doesn't matter, it's not essential, just kind of go away, be at the back end of things, you're really not contributing anything positive to society anyways, that there is a time to stand up and say, then we've lost our way. There's a time to push back. For example, the U.S. Supreme Court on a, on a Friday in July declined to lift a 50-person limit on religious services that were adopted by Nevada's governor in response to the pandemic. By a 5-4 to four vote, Supreme Court justices denied the request by Calvary Chapel, Dayton Valley, in rural Nevada for an interim order that would have allowed it to host services for about 90 congregants. The majority did not explain its reasoning. Justice Samuel Lito wrote in a dissent that Nevada was discriminating against religious groups in favor of casinos. This is where it gets interesting, which under the governor's reopening plans did not face the same 
50 person limits on indoor gatherings. So the quote says that, uh, Justice uh, Alito, that Nevada would discriminate in favor of the powerful gaming industry and its employees may not come as a surprise, but that this court's willingness to allow such discrimination is disappointing. Alito added that the governor's plans, he noted, allowed for thousands of people to gather in casinos. Yet 90 who gather to worship in the name of Jesus cannot. When casinos can open to fuel what? What contribution to society is that making? When casinos can be open and churches cannot, even if those churches would agree to strict social distancing and one-tenth of the amount of people, and that's illegal, we've lost our way. It's time to push back. <laughs> One church in Nevada, oh, you could just find it online, look it up. Uh, I saw it's so awesome. Because they were not allowed to meet by the state's orders and unfortunately the Supreme Court's orders as well. And they're a church of several hundred. So you know what they did? They rented out a ballroom in the casino and had hundreds gathered in Jesus' name. <laughs> it's awesome. Look it up. It's really cool. And it's totally stupid at the same time. We've lost our way when that's, hey, that's fine. That's fine. Another example, Mayor Bill de Blasio of New York said to the Jewish community in a tweet, my message to the Jewish community and all communities is simple. The time for warnings has passed. I have instructed the NYPD to proceed immediately to summons or even arrest those who gather in large groups because they gathered in a funeral to mourn the passing of a rabbi. This is about stopping the disease and saving lives, period. What I saw I will, will not be tolerated as long as we're fighting the coronavirus. Until two weeks later when protests broke out by the thousands and tens of thousands, then this tweet just disappeared and meant nothing. Similarly, Santa, Car Santa Clara County in California, public health officials who encourage mass protests as a, quote, fundamental right that is critical to the health of our democracy. The county also told protesters, we are with you and we hear you. At the same time, which I'm all about, that fundamental right, absolutely, I agree within the Constitution. Fundamental right, critical to the health of democracy. I can get behind that, amen. But we have lost our way when at the same time as supporting mass protests, the county had continued to uphold its restriction to, to that outdoor services, outdoor services of churches could have no more than 25 people. So at the same time of saying protests are good, it's healthy, we see you by the thousands. Outdoor services are no more than 25 if you're gathering to worship God. We've lost our way. Furthermore, the California governor, as you know, added that you can't sing in church. <laughs> we missed that memo. So, my posture is <laughs> okay so with a mask on <laughs> no singing because that's dangerous but you can shout loudly chant sing if you're protesting because there's a supernatural protective bubble upon you there the holy spirit is there protecting the right to protest oh no sorry our authorities didn't say that. So if anyone asks and shows up here, we are gathering to peacefully protest because there is a supernatural bubble of protection upon all protesters. And it's true. We protest the work of Satan in the world every Sunday when we're singing. So when we suspend the rights to gather in worship, 
but encourage gathering to protest, which I agree with as well, that's when we've lost our way and we need to push back. And singing in church is not simply a, a, a social club enjoying a nice time. That's where we enter into an almost 3,000 year history of the, the Judeo-Christian tradition of gathering in public. There's something about it. This is core to practicing our faith. This is core to the free expression of our religion. This is not a social club. It's not about singing a nice tune. This is about a 3,000 year old history where we believe that when we gather in the name of God, the very presence of of God inhabits his people in a way that it doesn't happen anywhere else. And though there can be times of, for a short amount of time, maybe you got to watch it online for a day or a week or you're sick or whatever, it is not the same as gathering in person in the name of Jesus. And so our, our, our faith is on the line. Our free expression of religion is on the line. In person matters all throughout God's word. It's nothing less than the very encountering of God that's on the line. To the way and degree and type that God designed. It's, a, it's the very life source of our faith. It's to, encounter, it's to encounter him together. That corporate gathering is utterly sacred. The corporate experience of the Spirit of God is that, that, that a source of refreshing hope. It's renewing the mind. It's strengthening the spirit. It even heals the body. It waters the soul so that we can go out and live good fruit, bear good fruit. So that's where we push back and we say, no, in-person gathering of church is essential. And the painful and destructive result of, of not being able to gather together as a church family, as church families, and encounter God is what many people are going through right now. Which the CDC even recently reported, shockingly admitted, that 40% of Americans, 40% of U.S. adults are reporting, so if they're reporting, it's probably higher, 40% are reporting that they are struggling with a mental or emotional health crisis. And 25% of young adults in the age range of 18 to 24, 18 to 24 have, quote, seriously considered suicide in the last 30 days. That's one in four. And it's all having to do with just isolation, loneliness, lack of community. And the deaths of despair, as we talked about a few weeks ago, are skyrocketing to where deaths of despair, the increase of the amount of deaths in our country due to alcohol abuse, drug abuse, and suicide are right now projected by some doctors. The longer this shutdown order stays in place, the death numbers of despair will actually come close to rivaling the death numbers of COVID itself. And that's, the CDC is, is affirming these numbers. And what's the solution? The public health response. Here's the CDC, quote, the solution to this, the public health response to COVID pandemic should, listen, increase intervention and prevention efforts to address these mental health conditions with community level efforts. In other words, if you want people to be able to come back from, he from mental, emotional crisis induced by the loneliness, the isolation, the fear, then you need community-level connections. <laughs> Hello? We're over here. Can you take us out of the fine print of page 27, please? That's our job. It's one of our jobs. We're not the only people. There's other groups as well. But 1 Thessalonians 5.1 says this is our job in a crisis. Encourage one another. Build one another up. There is, by the Holy Spirit's power, a life-giving force that is encountered 
when you are together in community. And so when the government says we need local community level in intervention to stop a mental and emotional health crisis, but then says, but the church is not essential, so stay closed, I believe we have the moral and spiritual obligation to push back and say, we're here. You need prayer? Come on in. You're hurting? Come on in. You need hope? Come on in. You need provision for a job? Come on in. You need peace? Come on in. This is where churches are. The, the place churches have the soul saving, peace giving, abundant life, good news of the anchor for your soul in Jesus Christ. Churches stay open to say, be healed, be encouraged, be lifted up, be delivered. And while the government has no solution, the church can and should shine with the only real and lasting solution. So church, it's not time to shrink back and disappear. The world's kind of on fire in some ways. The people are hurting. Church has a solution. It's not time to lower the sails and disappear, but just to be present with the good news that everyone is longing for. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless your church in the world. Bless your bride. We pray that your Holy Spirit would continue and increase in measure, blowing through the churches, reviving us, lifting us up, making us strong in you, helping us not shrink back, but to see you, to see what you're saying, to see what you're doing. Help us recapture that prophetic zeal and prophetic voice that would stand up and just speak truth to our society, to the powers that be, not out of a flippant or a contrarian attitude, but because we're confident in you, that we know, Jesus, you are the solution. You are the only and lasting best solution to all the problems we face. We pray that you would empower us with that truth, Lord. Give us those divine appointments where we can be the church out in the world. But I pray that you would protect us being essential. Protect churches being able to gather in the name of Jesus to encounter your Holy Spirit. To encounter that life transforming experience of God in our midst. And Lord, we pray that you would draw people to your church. Those who are hurting, lost, hopeless, wrestling with these, these mental and emotional crises, we pray that you would help them to look up and look out and find churches, find people who have your solution, God. Lord, we help, uh, pray that you would help us find the, the proper heart set and mindset not in a flippant arrogance, but in one that in a confidence, confidence in you says, now's the time to push back. No, we will resist for the name of Jesus because he is the solution. I felt like the Lord just spoke this verse to me um, just now. It was Psalm 27, verse 5. I'm going to start reading in verse 4. One thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Verse, this is verse 5. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon the rock. The Lord's temple, his church, is supposed to be a place where we can hide in his shelter, where we are concealed and covered by him, where we come arm in arm and hand in hand with the body of Christ, and we are lifted high upon a rock. And so, God, we say yes and amen to your power preserving your church in America 
and across the world, that we would continue to be a place, a sanctuary, where people can come and taste and drink of you and receive hope and be lifted high upon a rock when they are in a pit. And so, God, we thank you for the rumble. We thank you for the pushback. We thank you that we stand holding your hand, saying yes to you, that your gates will not close, that your arms are open through your people. God, we thank you that this is your will on earth as it is in heaven. And God, where, where would our nation be if Martin Luther King didn't take your hand and say yes to you and challenge the governing authorities when they were pushing back on the rights of your children and the livelihood of your children. What an example he is of a man who chose your will, your agenda, and your kingdom and changed our world to bring heaven to earth in a mighty way for every nation, tongue, tribe, race to be able to worship together and have equal treatment. And so God, we just in that same spirit of wanting to partner with you and to see your kingdom manifest on earth and be brought to earth. We just stand with you. We worship you, God. Let this place, let our nation be a place of worship. Let our nation be a place of worship. May the singing that is here explode all over the nation. And we ask for um, a mighty way being made in the wilderness, a way being made in the Red Sea, in the governing authorities, in those um, who are shutting down churches, specifically Gavin Newsom in California. We just declare, a, we just ask for a softening of their hearts, that their eyes would be able to see the good that we are far more valuable than casinos, that your hope is real, that you heal, that you bring alive. And God, we ask that you would also just raise up your spirit within your church to push back, to say yes to you, to say yes to your power, your love, and your goodness in our nation. Thank you, God, for a mighty wave of your power among us working to reopen churches and not only reopen churches, God, magnify your name, magnify the mighty deliverance of our Jesus, that there would be a great awakening as these churches are pushing back and opening, that there would be a great awakening and a move of your spirit that that 40% of um, where people are, that where there's depression and a mental health crisis and where people are contemplating suicide, that that would take a mighty shift, that that would drop to nothing. And the stories that we will be hearing as the Christians step out in obedience and in faith, both in our communities and in coming together to worship you in church, that the testimony would be that those numbers are dropping, that they are disappearing, and that there is a wave of healing, of goodness, of revival, of good tidings, and of stories of you working powerfully, bringing life in Jesus' name. Amen.